Good morning and welcome to worship. I want to revisit the words that you read in the weekly notices as an introduction to worship this morning. Words that captured a phrase that's drawn me into reflection through this week. As we enter the season of Advent, we're once again swept up in God's unhurried urgency. Unhurried urgency. At first that sounds like a contradiction in terms, but then as you hold those words for a while, that they reveal so much. This idea serves to put a turbo charge to the hope that we hold and begins afresh to impel us to think about our witness in the world. The poet George Herbert once wrote, he who believes in hope dances without, without music. This is a great picture of a life of faith. To hope in God's grace is to move to a rhythm that other people may not initially hear. It's to act out a drama that others may not quickly imagine. It's to glide through life guided by a tune that plays clearly in your own heart. And yet it serves as an invitation for others to notice and wonder. And then with the help of the Holy Spirit of God to find real meaning both for this coming Christmas season and for life itself. Let's pray, shall we? God of faithful love, ever resourceful, ever merciful, we draw near to you because you first drew near to us. You create the longing in our souls, the love in our hearts, the faith that delivers our whole being from hopelessness. Thank you for this season of reflection, the season of preparation. Help us this morning to take the time to nourish our souls, to open our minds and hearts, that you might bring us to a new sense of anticipation of your Holy Spirit moving among us. Bless us as we seek to bless your heart in worship. And give us, we pray, provide for us those things that we need to truly worship you in spirit and in truth. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
we come to a time of prayer again, this time a prayer of confession of sins. Let's pray. Lord God, forgive us when we lose focus. Forgive us when we get sucked into the hustle and the bustle and when we fall into the malaise and that spa space of spiritual lethargy. In the quietness of this place, hear our prayer as we confess before you our sins. Hear our prayer. Lord, we so identify with Paul who wrote, the good things I want to do, I so often don't. And yet the evil that I don't want, that I end up doing. Thank you that Christ who offered himself once for, to bear the sins of many will come again to save those who are waiting for him. And thank you that in the meantime, we live in this season of grace where we can come to you and receive that forgiveness and refresh our hope. These things we pray in your name. Amen. Well, hear the good news. The scripture reminds us that when we confess our sins, God is both faithful and just and will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And on the basis of that promise and on the basis of God's goodness, I can declare God has heard your prayer. Our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Now, in terms of our announcements uh, this morning, those of you who are watching this on a Sunday morning, uh, this morning we are going to be having our congregational meeting and your weekly notices will offer a Zoom link for that meeting and we'll spell out the voting procedures there as well. There's a couple of other things that are coming up that I would like to highlight. The first is a blue Christmas service here at the church on Thursday, the 3rd of December, this coming Thursday at 11 o'clock. Registrations for this service are being taken by the Neighbourhood Centre. What's a Blue Christmas? Well, this is a contemplative service for those who have known grief and loss. Those who will be keenly aware when Christmas comes around that there is one less familiar face at the Christmas table. Those for whom the jolly carols of Christmas really bring no joy. This is a time to reflect, to sit with God in this space and to find a gentle comfort. If you know someone for whom this could be helpful, don't just tell them about it, bring them. And if this is something that you feel might help you, please come along. 11 o'clock this coming Thursday. We'll now give thanks to God for his provision and dedicate our tithes and offerings to the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you have cared for us and sustain us. More than that, you have framed our lives with your hope. Lord, accept our gifts, our tithes and our offerings and make these available to help hope be available to others as well, in this place and beyond. Bless these gifts and each giver. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
was the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship Your holy name. song again whatever may pass and whatever lies before me let me be singing when the evening comes you're rich in love and you're slow For all your goodness I will keep on singing Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find Bless the Lord, oh my soul Oh my soul Worship His holy draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forever more oh bless the Lord bless the Lord oh my soul oh His holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul I worship your holy name Bless the Lord, oh my soul Oh my soul Worship His holy name your holy name I worship your holy name I worship your holy name Welcome to Children's Time I read that if you live to be 70 years old, you will spend three years of your time just waiting. Waiting in line at the supermarket, waiting in the doctor's office, waiting for lunch to be ready, waiting for playtime at school. My husband had a hot rod and sometimes it would break down. So I always took a book with me so that if we were waiting for the RACQ, I had something to do. In his book, Oh, the places you'll go. Dr. Seuss talks about a place called the waiting place. He describes it as a useless place where people are just waiting. He says, waiting for a train to go or a bus to come or a plane to go or the mail to come or the rain to go or the phone to ring or the snow to snow or waiting around for a yes or a no or waiting for their hair to grow. Everyone is just waiting. I don't particularly like waiting, do you? I don't like it, but I don't know of any way to avoid it. We all have to spend some time 
in this waiting place that Dr. Seuss talks about. But I don't think it has to be useless time. We're, while we're waiting, what can we do? Well, we could read a good book or call a friend. We could make a list of things we need to do today, or we could even study for a test at school. Well, that might be going a bit too far, but there are many things we can do besides just waiting. Today is the first Sunday of Advent. Advent means to come. Do you know what's coming? Christmas is coming, of course. This is an exciting time, but it may also be a difficult time of waiting, especially for kids. Waiting for the day when we can open the presents under the tree. What can we do to make this time of waiting for Christmas more than just a useless time in the waiting place? Well, we can think about the true meaning of Christmas. We can think about Jesus and his love. We can think about giving instead of receiving. We can enjoy all the beautiful music and the decorations. When we do these things, we might find joy in the waiting place. We are waiting for Christmas, but we're also waiting for something else. We're waiting for Jesus' return. He told us that he would come again, and he told us to watch and be ready for him. What should we do while we're waiting? We should worship and praise him, love and serve him, and share his love with others. We can look forward with great joy to the celebration of Jesus' birth and to the day when he comes again. When we are doing these things, we will be ready for his return and we will find joy in the waiting place. God bless you all. The Old Testament reading is Isaiah 64 verses 1 to 9. Oh, that you would burst from the heavens and come down, how the mountains would quake in your presence. As fire causes wood to burn and water to boil, your coming would make the nations tremble. Then your enemies would learn the reason for your fame. When you came down long ago, you did awesome deeds beyond our highest expectations. And oh, how the mountains quaked. For since the world began, no ear has heard and no eye has seen a God like you, who works for those who wait for him. You welcome those who gladly do good, who follow godly ways. But you have been very angry with us, for we are not godly. We are constant sinners. How can people like us be saved? We are all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they are nothing but filthy rags. Like autumn leaves, we wither and fall, and our sins sweep us away like the wind. Yet no one calls on your name or pleads with you for mercy. Therefore you have turned away from us and turned us over to our sins. And yet, Lord, and yet O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We are all formed by your hand. Don't be so angry with us, Lord. Please don't remember our sins forever. Look at us, we pray, and see that we are all your people. And the Gospel reading is Mark chapter 13, verses 24 to 37. At that time, after the anguish of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will give no light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then everyone will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with great power and glory. And he will send out his angels to gather his chosen ones from all over the world from the farthest ends of the earth and heaven. Now learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things taking place, you can know that his return is very near, right at the door. I tell you the truth. This generation will not pass from the scene before all these things take place. Heaven and earth will disappear but my words will never disappear. However, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen, not even angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. 
And since you don't know when that time will come, be on guard. Stay alert. The coming of the Son of Man can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. When he left home, he gave each of his slaves instructions about the work they were to do. And he told the gatekeeper to watch for his return. You too must keep watch, for you don't know when the master of the household will return. In the evening, at midnight, before dawn or at daybreak. Don't let him find you sleeping when he arrives without warning. I say to you what I say to everyone. Watch for him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What do you like at waiting? Most of us perhaps can relate to what was commonplace in the years before digital photography. You'd have a film in the camera for months on end, perhaps tucked away in a drawer uh, between big occasions. But the day you open that drawer and discover it, you take it to the developer and pay the extra $3.95 to get it printed in the less than one hour deal. Yep. But in God's timing, there is a purpose for our waiting. It has meaning. We are called to wait because it reminds us that is not our plan that is pending. It's God's plan. I've given some serious reflection time to the phrase used in the article I presented in this week's notices that I started the service with. That phrase, God's unhurried urgency. The divinely felt urgency that each is that each generation should not lose sight but rather be prepared and watchful and unhurried because it's about God's character and longing. What does that timing tell us about the character of God? Well, this is what it says to me, that God is patient and gracious. Patient, gracious. These are words that stand in, in sharp contrast to our culture. During these four weeks leading up to Christmas, even in this era of online purchasing, I suspect we'll notice if we take a little excursion to any shopping center and find that patience might just be a little thin on the ground. We are a fast food society, a microwave society, a broadband internet society. We live in a world that applauds arrivals, finish lines, shortcuts, and end products far more than it does the meandering journey. We want what we want and we want it now. And our culture affirms those desires. Where I think there may be some evidence of increased impatience among our generations, I also think it is, it is hardwired into our psyche in general. Pandemic fatigue and uncertainty have only exacerbated it. Well, Jesus spoke in reference to the fig tree of the need to read the signs of the times. And these are the signs of ours. Impatience, a sense of being worn down and worn out, hurt, and the very real impact of hurting for others. And so framed by the context of our world at this time, our Isaiah reading in particular lends its voice to our own. Oh, that you would burst through the heavens and come down. Well, the world may be a little bit less specific about who they're saying that to, but the cry is the same. Help! Somebody! Anybody! This is the cry of so very many on the earth this day with infection rates and death tolls climbing alarmingly again, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. 
This is the heart cry. Realities around us have reminded us about the fragility of life. And not only in the arena of sickness, with political uncertainty and new emergent superpower rattling sabers, economic pain in so many places, the cry is clear. Is it directed at God? Sadly, not often enough. And, and here's the rub. Christ's reference to the sign of the times offers more mystery than it does concrete certainties. And perhaps this in itself triggers more uncertainty because every generation has seen signs in our own generations and the generations of our parents. Were not the world wars potential signs? And in World War II, the Holocaust that befell the Jews? Two decades later, when the Cold War ramped up to the point that much of the world held its breath again in the Cuban Missile Crisis, was that not also seen as a sign? Shortly after the turn of this century, the world changed. The hands of terrorists brought that about. Not only that that was captured on the repeated televised screening of the collapse of the Twin Towers in New York, but also the widespread acts of terrorism elsewhere. Were they not signs? Fear reigned, and people wondered where it would next strike. And in each aspect of this short and incomplete list of notable world events over the last 120 years, Christian churches at all of those times filled as people called out to God. Perhaps it's ironic that the pandemic that swept the world over the last 12 months has by definition prohibited people from gathering in the houses of worship. But statisticians tell us that Google has been flooded with questions about how to pray. And what am I saying? Any of those could be interpreted as the sign, and yet they weren't. Yet they provided for each era a wake-up call and a reminder to keep watching. And just as the faithful have responded in these seasons, so God will equip his people to respond to each sign and in the, and in the final indisputable sign. It's the gift of the stirring of God's unhurried urgency for the day that does it. And that's important to us for that day, but also for the day that we meet him face to face as our lives come to an end, whichever way that comes first. So God, I believe, will and is using the signs of the times. Everyone, I think, feels this sense of urgency, the tension, but most, it seems, don't really know where to look. It's like feeling thirsty if you're anything like me, but instead of reaching for that glass of water, heading for the fridge for a snack. The belly says, I need something, but we misread and misdirect. Well, our world is looking for an answer, but too many are placing their hopes in the change of leaders in the US or a new post-Brexit reality that will make Britain thrive on its own once again or a vaccine that will make this pandemic go away. And perhaps even you and I are swept up in this very human-focused hope. The lyrics of a well-known Christmas hymn, O Holy Night, sum up the world as many are experiencing it. A weary world looking to rejoice you know, we'll eventually see that Boris Johnson and Joe Biden are not gods. And the Paris Agreement in and of itself will not save the world. 
and where the pandemic will end, what eats at the core of our trouble will not. Like autumn leaves, Isaiah wrote, we wither and fall, and our sins sweep us away like the wind, and yet no one calls on your name or pleads with you for mercy. The sin, our determination to live without God, to follow our own appetites that lead to greed, waste, self-interest, criticism of others, jealousy, bitterness, and so the list goes on. And Isaiah's truth is also our truth. The earth, maybe even we ourselves, want good news, but we would rather not deal with the bad news. Yes, Isaiah has summed up the signs of our times. And as in Isaiah's day, God's people needed both to seek him and to wait. A few minutes ago in children's time, Heather nailed it. Waiting is hard. And for our own good, God leads his people once again to enter a season of remembering how to wait. Advent has come and the word is wait, watch. But how will others see, we might ask? How will we see and interpret what it is that God wants us to be watching and waiting for? Well, let me suggest that waiting doesn't mean sitting on your hands. It doesn't mean sitting by the window with our, or with our eyes glued to the pages of scripture each and every waking hour of every day. We will see the coming of the kingdom, at least in terms of, of God's short-term plans, as we become hope bearers. And in so doing, whenever it is that the next stage of, for humanity unfolds, we will have our focus right. We are to be signs of our times. We are to dance when others don't hear music. We are to be hope bearers. Not because COVID rates aren't spiking among us. Not because politically we're living in a relative calm. But because we know the source of hope. In the darkness, we are to be the light of the world the sign for people to see. We need to remember the grace that changed our lives and that God's faithfulness sustains us. In the midst of mess and uncertainty, we can point to God's coming message, his coming Messiah. The Christmas Story. How would you explain it? How would you picture Christmas if you could frame it? The Nativity, right? Shepherds watching their flocks by night. Wise men trekking whilst tracking a sat-nav starlight with Mary and Joseph, humbled by the sight of little baby Jesus tucked in tight. That's Christmas, right? Propped up with straw and reeds and a tray of animal feed and cushioned in. Hey, I know it sounds quite cozy and nice, Reality was, there was no room for the little guy on that Bethlehem night. He kept in a cradle. Animals as roommates. I'm not trying to pick holes in the state of the place. I'm just saying the way they were staying was just short of space. We talk about entrance. His birth from a dress meant Jesus literally arrived in the mess. Well, less about the birthplace and the state of the floor. I mean, there's more to the Christmas story than the deck of straw. Flip forward eight days. In the temple, this little guy's the reason for praise. From the lips of a guy called Sim who's in his old age. For years, Sim waited in anticipation, but then the old met the new. My eyes have seen your salvation, the newborn Jesus, from messy manger to a passing of the baton just eight days later, seeing the mess of the birth comes a new age and what's more 
the birth was foretold in a mess age. Which brings us back to the cast. At the nativity set, you see, it was a message that guided their stable footsteps. An angel postman popped round, said Mary'd found favour. A save the date declaration, you'll give birth to the saviour. He'd be son of the most high, born through the spirit, heir to David's throne, his reign without limit to Joseph. Call him Jesus, he really will bless, cause he came to save people from all their mess. To the shepherds, he's here to rescue. That's why he's come. The reason for good news of joy, he's the one. As for the wise men, they figured the news. They gave gifts and paid homage to little king of the Jews. See, God brought the message, so they entered the mess to see Jesus' arrival at the nativity set. But let's back up a sec. See, this rhetoric rings a bell. Back in the day, Isaiah waxed lyrical about a future, Emmanuel, God with us, one who be central to the story of forgiveness. So zoom out from the Christmas postcard, a message 700 years prior. He'll be a light to the searchers that spread salvation, says Isaiah. See, the angel's news, it wasn't new. In fact, these nativity messages echoed God's promises right through the ages. These messages read Jesus, speaking hope to the earth, predicting his arrival centuries before the birth. Thing is, when Christmas comes round, maybe there's a danger that we go Pinterest with Christmas and just pin up the manger in the nativity scene. It's like rating a whole film by watching one scene or thinking you know a novel because you had a quick look. So you get the whole story by skim reading one page in a book. And what I said before about him born in the mess and the deco of straw, maybe it could also be a metaphor for all the mistakes, all the messiness in life and what that creates, all the stuff in this world that just doesn't sit right. There was a reason he was born on that first Christmas night. He was born in the mess to make the wrong right. This is the message of hope. Because <laughs> out of the mess, so God names birth that will certainly bless. Frame the stable, sure, but don't miss the picture. It was a message declared since the beginning of scripture. A war in the mess, but there's only one victor. A heel bruised, but be good news for sure. The very promise became flesh in that deck out of straw. See, from the mess comes a message and there's none that is higher. Because what follows the mess is I-A-H. Mess, I am. We come now to a time once again to pray, this time prayer for ourselves and for the needs of others. Let's pray. 
Lord God, very few of us get through life without some pain and some sorrow. Help us to meet those hard times with you by our side and to, by the initiative of your grace, to turn setbacks into times of, of growth and fruitfulness. Lord, in this quiet place, hear our prayer. And Lord, just as we pray for ourselves, we also pray for every other person on this planet. Wherever there is disease and disability, agony and grief, please grant to your children the ability not merely just to cope, but to find glimmers of triumph, even in the bleakest and darkest of nights. Lord, hear our prayer. Holy God, enable us and all people the ability to challenge the greed and the violence, the injustice and the neglect of our world that so magnify the pain and the sorrow of humanity with Christ's word and way as our guide, assist us to play our parts in the ongoing work of salvation, counting no person as too insignificant or no one as too evil to be outside of your redeeming love. Lord, hear our prayer. Loving God, head of the church, help your church universal, we pray, to mend its rifts and to demolish its many walls of division, that together we might be able to testify to our generations by our love one for another of a God who seeks to reconcile all things through grace, mercy and peace. Lord, hear our prayer. And hear us now as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well 
bearing all my sin and shame, in love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you for your nailed Wash me in your cleansing flow. Just before I declare the benediction, may I remind you of two things. Firstly, that we have a congregational meeting on Sunday morning this morning. And secondly, that if you would like someone to pray for the things that are, are on your heart, by all means contact us and we would love to join our prayers with yours. Now, go out into the world in the power of the Spirit. In all things and at all times, remember that Christ is with you. Make your life your worship to the praise and glory of God. And may the blessing of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit abide with you now and evermore. Amen. Amen.